Well, we are working for our second week, kind of do a mini-series on prayer from Romans 12, 2, uh, seeing how many sermons I can get out of three words. In prayer persevering. Romans chapter 12. Let's go to the second slide. These are, in 2015, I think it was December of 2015, uh, these were some articles that came out after uh, a shooting in San Bernardino, California that left 14 uh, dead. And, and please understand, I, I am making no statement about gun policy, okay? That's not my point. My point is prayer. That, that's my concern. That we have an article, uh, if you notice it says, God isn't fixing this. God isn't fixing this. Well, despite the reality that, that God sent Jesus Christ to fix this very kind of thing, to destroy the works of the devil, to work uh, against the enemy who tries to enslave people to steal, kill, and destroy, that God did send Jesus to fix this, and we have, as a world, rejected his Christ, his Messiah. Despite, despite that fact... I want us to, to try to say, what are they saying about prayer when they say God isn't fixing this? I, I think they're saying prayer doesn't work. I, I think they're saying prayer is a waste of time. That there are more important things we need to be doing than praying. And if you look at the subheading, it says, As latest batch of innocent Americans are left lying in pools of blood. And it says those who could truly do something about it continue to hide behind meaningless, and then they use the word platitudes. If, so if you are one who, when some tragic thing happens, you say to somebody, I'm praying for you. Well, that's a platitude, right? That's what they're saying. And, and look, I, we have to recognize there are... There are you can do a lot of things. You probably should do a lot of things after you've prayed. But you, you should not do anything before you've prayed. Okay? And to see prayer as a platitude. Now I reference this story because we began looking last week at things that make prayer hard. Things that make prayer difficult. And then how to prevail over those hurdles, over those obstacles. So today we're going to look at a few more challenges to prayer. And basically what I've done, we're starting and we're, we're, we're using Romans 12, Romans 12, 12 and, as a, a launching point to get us thinking about this. And I, I say that explicitly because I don't want you to come to me afterwards and say, how did you get those three points from Romans 12, 12? Okay. Romans 12, 12, Paul says, work hard at persistently, rigorously, untiringly praying. Okay, that's what Romans 12, 12 says. So based on that, it seems to be true that, that prayer takes work. Prayer takes focus. Prayer takes energy. And so I want us to apply that truth and ask, how is it? That, that prayer is so hard. What makes prayer so tough for us? Like last week we said you know, prayer is strange. Prayer, prayer is just, it's, it's strange. It's not our, our natural person's response to something. This week I had something, a conflict come up, and my natural, my fleshly response was to, to do a, a smackdown on the person, right? Not, not literally, not literally. But to win the thing, to to defeat the problem by power. My, it was not my natural default to pray. And when the world looks at us, and this, this uh, headline is a perfect example, when the world looks at us and says, what good is prayer? They ought to look at us and say, man, you are strange in, in how much you rely on God. Because it's a, it's a foreign thing to them. How beautiful it is when the world sees us praying, being a praying people, 
a people who commune with God, find our strength in God, find our direction in God. And so this morning, we will look at, at, a, at a few more things that make prayer hard and how we can persevere and prevail in prayer. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we come to you not, not like rubbing a genie lamp, hoping it will do something specific that will get our wish. But we come to you because you have invited us into your presence. We come to you because you have made the way, you have removed every obstacle um, for our coming into your presence by sending Jesus Christ to remove the sin that kept us out of your presence. And so we joyfully come to spend time with you, to listen to you. And, and Father, we desire to hear from you through your word this morning. We desire for your spirit who indwells those who, who are believers in Jesus Christ. We desire your spirit who lives in us to speak, to teach, to direct, to give hope and encouragement, to restore Father, we need you. We come into your presence because we're a needy people. So, Father, this morning as we consider reasons why it is so hard to pray like we ought, to take advantage of communion with you like we should, Father, I pray that our conclusion would be ways to prevail. Ways to per persevere, ways to work untiringly at interceding for others, at seeking your wisdom, at enjoying your presence. Father, may we grow in being a, a praying people, and may it, may it be strange to the world. May we pray so fervently that, that the world thinks we're a bit odd, but may they also see our hope and our joy in the midst of, of difficulty, and may they be persuaded to trust Jesus Christ. So, Father, this morning, may our hearts be tender to your word. May your word come alive to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, a second reason, in addition to being strange, uh, a second reason that prayer is hard is because it requires discipline. When I say the word discipline, how many of you just get this warm, fuzzy feeling inside? All right? In seminary, I had a friend, John Bradley. Good man. He, he, he was not a seminary student. He worked at Lockheed. He was an engineer. His life was so disciplined that even his benevolence giving was like super disciplined. Every paycheck he would take a $50 bill, put it in his wallet because he knew God would bring somebody his way that needed help. And it was every part of his life was like this. I mean, he did, he did woodworking, but he didn't, he didn't do woodworking like I do it. I do it like three, third times a charm, right, if I'm lucky. And you try it, you mess up. You try it, you mess he, he was like measured and intentional, and everything was precise. And except for the rare guy who makes us all feel a little bit like slackers, they're so disciplined. Most of us struggle in the area of discipline, if we're honest. And maybe not all areas. We may have one or two areas we're pretty disciplined in, but, but if we're honest, spiritual disciplines are not the area of strength. So discipline. Discipline is just doing things uh, consistently that are, that are healthy, right? Things like eating right uh, in the moment for long-term health, okay? Or going to bed at a decent time. I mean, I t I've been struggling with that lately. I have a burning candle at both ends. I have not been disciplined just to stop and say, my body probably needs to sleep, all right? Keeping a healthy rhythm in general, exercising regularly, setting healthy limits for, for Netflix and social media, Insta Instagram, video games, that kind of thing. Healthy boundaries. So disciplines 
are things we choose to do on a regular schedule that may be difficult but are for the long-term good. That's what a, that's what a discipline is. And, and so even if we're super disciplined about some things, and oftentimes we'll be like, I, we, I'm so disciplined about what I eat or I'm so disciplined about exercise. I go to the gym every day. And we kind of rest on the, the, the thought that I'm really disciplined in that way, so it's okay if I'm not disciplined in other ways. Paul talks about discipline in 1 Timothy 4, uh, verses 7 and 8, where he tells the young Timothy, he says, Timothy, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now, the, the in the original language, that word train yourself, it's a word that you'll recognize. If I say it in Greek, it's, it's gymnazo or gymnazo, depending on hard or soft G there, from which we get the word gymnasium, right? That's the, that's the thought. That's the way the, 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 the family, the word, that word is a part of. It's exercise, the place of exercise. Um, in ancient Greek, in, in some places, that word means to exercise uh, nakedly. I'm not, that's not what Paul's talking about here, all right? Just want to clarify, if you're looking at your Greek Bible this morning, no. Um, but what he is talking about is he's taking the secular word back then, right? And he's giving a, a, a spiritual meaning to it. He, he's saying, look, prayer, uh, being godly, it's not something that just happens, right? Oh, how I would love uh, for, spirit, for, for my godliness just to be something that happened, right? It doesn't. It's a discipline. It takes discipline. It takes work. And just as one works untiringly to excel in any other way, you know, ath athletically or any other way, um, we, we've got to train for godliness. We've got to have a diet of, of prayer and an exercise, a workout of prayer, and when we don't make something a, a regularly scheduled part of our lives, um, it becomes one of those things that's, well, I'll do it when I get around to it, right? I, I, it's important. We would all say prayer is important, right? And, and, and probably most Americans would say at some point I pray, when I get down to rock bottom, I, I look up. Uh, I, I try to meet with two other pastors monthly, pastors that I've known for for almost 20 years, and we try to get together at least, we used to meet, meet weekly. Every, every Thursday morning, we would meet, and we would share sermon ideas and thoughts and, and uh, interpret the Bible together and, and just hold each other accountable. It was, it was a really sweet time, and, and, and as I've moved to Beckley, and they're still in, in Princeton, and it's hard to get together, so we try to do it monthly. But you know what? If we don't schedule it, guess what? It doesn't happen. It gets pushed out by other important things. You see, the schemes of the enemy, a few, we're to know the schemes of the enemy, right? And, and some of the schemes of the enemy regarding prayer is you don't need to make prayer a daily discipline. You'll remember it without doing that. Eh. Maybe you're more, maybe you remember better than I do. Or maybe, maybe it's this scheme. You don't need to be more disciplined in prayer. It will just become dry and dusty. If it's, a, if it's a discipline, it's just going to be dry and dusty. You know, not being disciplined in prayer because it could feel dry or dusty is like saying, don't eat right, it won't taste good, you won't enjoy it. Don't exercise, it will be painful, you'll be sore. Yeah! Yeah, that's what exercise does. Uh, disciplines are intentional parts of our lives. We don't do them thoughtlessly. Colossians 4.2, I think, gets at this idea of being intentional. It says, be devoted to prayer, keeping alert in it with thanksgiving. Be watchful. Don't fall asleep. You're going to have to do this purposefully. By the way, that word there uh, in Colossians 4.2, be devoted, the very same word that's in Romans 12.12. 12, right? Tirelessly committed to persevere in it. Be devoted to it. And, and, and it's also interesting, I think, it's helpful to me when it says, be devoted to prayer. And then what follows the word keeping, 
What does it end in? I-N-G, which makes it a participle, which means that that is telling us how to be devoted. So in Romans 12, 12, when he says regarding prayer, be devoted, be uh, persevering, right? Well, how do we do that? Well, Colossians 4, 2 tells us ex- two ways at least, or one way with, a, with a, a, a clarification. He says, keeping alert in it. Do it intentionally. Be uh, purposeful with thanksgiving. That's one way we can persevere in it. And so, to be disciplined in prayer, you make it a priority. And that means when you wake up in the morning, you make it a priority. I don't have it in my notes, but I, I think it was Luther that said, I've got so many things I have to do today, I must spend two hours in prayer. Just stop and think about that. He's got the right idea. So make it a priority. Have a time and a place. You don't set a time and a place. uh, There'll be distractions. It probably won't happen. And make a plan. Have a list. Uh, There are, on my phone, I've got a prayer request app, right? I think it's called Prayer Notes. And you just, if, if you've got your phone with you everywhere, someone says, hey, pray for this, right? You can keep a list. You can use that kind of list. You can use a paper and ink list. Look, you can even pray through the church directory. How awesome is that to just go through it? You know, on Mondays, do A through F. You know, divide it up. But have a plan. And have a structure, uh, it, it helps to have a way to pray. And you might say, I don't know, what does that mean? Well, there are lots of different ways that help, uh, help you pray. One is acts, right? Where you, you have a time of adoration, a time of confession, a time of thanksgiving, a time of supplication. That stands for acts. It helps you remember it. Or uh, you can do what Donald Whitney would recommend and pray through Scripture. Now, for example, uh, you pick a psalm. And you read a psalm a day, and then you take your list, and you pray your list in light of the psalm. So our memory verse right now, blessed is the man who delights in the law of God. So, Father, help me to be the kind of man who delights in your law. Father, I I don't just want blessings Apart from that, I want to know you. And so I want to be the man that is blessed because I delight in your law. Father, teach me what that kind of delight looks like. Right? Father, limit you know, my delighting in worldly things. Father, remove those things that, that, are, that are obscuring my delight for your word. Um, so, so that's praying in light of Scripture. Father, help help. My church, if you're going to pray, if, you're, if, if your church is on your list, Father, help my Sunday, Sunday small group, help them to meditate on your word this week, day and night. So you could take a psalm, and you could take your list, and you'll be praying for your list, the same list every day pretty much, right? But in, in radically different ways, according to Scripture. So that's another, another structure you can use. A a third suggestion I have for you in terms of structures to pray, if you're you're like, my prayer is, it's just repetitive. Look, I get that. I get it can feel boring sometimes. It shouldn't. It's on us. But if it does, I mean, one time my, my prayer app, it had a cool little button, and the button was titled randomize, so that at least I wasn't praying in the same order every day. Do what you got to do. Here's another way. These little books um, by the Good Book Company. We've worked through some of these on Wednesday nights, but there are five things to pray. Okay, five things to pray. All of these are the same. Five things to pray. And what they do, this is five things to pray for your heart. And you can just go through one day at a time, and it helps you to pray distinctly for something else regarding your heart. There's another one, five things to pray for your church. So if you want to spend a month praying for your church, get this and and each morning pray 
distinctly for your church. Five things to pray for your city. Right? You don't have a plan. You don't have a structure. You don't have a place. You don't have a time. You don't have a priority. What's going to happen? It's not going to happen. So, retreats and, oh, by the way, just so you know, this book, Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney, it's a, it's a very easy read. Um, it's one of those just, just like, it's like a pleasure reading book, right? Um, but it's very helpful. And, and Crossway Publishers has given us 50 of these free. That's huge. And so we've got them in the foyer. And if you will read it, yeah, don't, sit, don't just take it, put it on your shelf. But if you will read it, we want you to have it. And so if you'll just grab one from a pastor on the way out, that would, that would be our gift today to you, all right? Um, all right. So one of the things I used to tell um, my students when, in, in, when I was a student pastor, and, and I, it's still true today for everybody, you know, retreats, you're going to retreat, that is awesome because retreats and um, spiritual experiences they can change your life direction. But not necessarily forever. Because they stop. You have to come home eventually, Mark. Right? You may want to stay on the mountain at Eagle Eyrie forever. It's beautiful. But those retreats end. But lasting change is produced by daily disciplines because they are daily. You spend time in prayer daily. You spend time in the Word daily. That is what brings lasting change to your life. If you're struggling, you had an experience, great. But if you want to stay in the Word of God and in prayer, it's going to fizzle. I guarantee it because there's an enemy. Because we have a sinful nature still that we're trying to, uh, to use the Puritan language, mortify, kill off. So, so train hard. Be intentional. Be disciplined in prayer. That is how you will prevail in prayer against that obstacle of it being a discipline. And don't go, oh, it's, it's not worth it. Look, I'll tell you what. When I exercise and I feel better and I don't hurt, it's worth it. But you've got to be disciplined and, and be regular about it. All right, the, the third, we'll do one more this morning. The third obstacle, the third reason prayer is hard is because it is opposed. It is opposed. When Jesus established his church, he declared that the gates of hell will not prevail. Now that language, the gates of hell will not prevail, it assumes the church to be advancing successfully into enemy territory and that the enemy's gates will fall before the gospel. So here's the truth. Christians who, like King David, abstain from going to war with the enemy will likely be less harassed by the enemy, or at least harassed in different ways. David was certainly harassed still. Different temptations. But here's the thing. I think if you, when, you, when you're not treading on the enemy's territory, he will be less interested to trip you up. If, he, if you're just being a passive believer and you're not going to war, you're not spending time in prayer uh, for, for the church, for yourself, for others, he's, he's not worried. Um, there's a, a, a Puritan named Richard Sibbs. Richard Sibbs, in his day was one of the, it was kind of like the Charles Stanley of today, right? Or the, or the David Jeremiah. That was Richard Sibbs. He was the most read Puritan in his day, his writings. And this is what he says. He says, when we go to God by prayer, the devil knows that we go to fetch strength against him. And therefore, he opposeth us all he can. Right? Uh, one one uh, commentary put it this way. If Satan can keep us out of touch with God, he will not have to worry about any trouble we might cause for his evil kingdom. And we see this reality clearly in Ephesians 5.18. 
which commands us to put on, right, that whole passage in Ephesians 5 is that putting on the armor of God. Put on every piece, the whole thing, and then it tells us how to do it. It says, put on the armor, and then it says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all supplication, with all prayer and supplication. Put on the armor, but don't you dare put it on without praying. Matter of fact, praying is the way you put it on. You look, you read Scripture, and you're like, okay, I, I need faith. Father, Father, give me the faith I lack. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Help me trust what is unseen. Help me have eyes that discern and a heart that leans on you heavily. You see, prayer is the way you put it on. You can't put on the armor apart from prayer because Paul says, put it on praying. In the Spirit. By the way, that's another reason why it's a strange thing. It is in the Spirit. Natural man can't pray that way. But we can pray uh, by the leading of the Spirit, by the enabling of the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, if you'll remember, what does it say about when you don't know how to pray? The Spirit intercedes for us with groans that are unutterable. When we're broken and hurting and we're like, God, I just don't, don't know what to say. And the Spirit says, it's okay, child, I've got this. I'll express your heart perfectly according to the will of God to the Father. Um, so, so in Ephesians 5, it says that prayer is the way to, to put on that, that armor. Matthew 26, 41 says, watch and pray. I mean, that's military lingo. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Folks, we, we still have the flesh and we long for the coming of Christ when this flesh will be redeemed finally and, per and ultimately perfected. But until that day, yes, amen, until that day, until that day, we struggle with it. We struggle against it. So, so oppose the, to oppose the enemy, do what the enemy opposes and pray, right? Do the work of preparing for spiritual battle prayerfully. If our enemy were earthly, we could fight in earthly ways. We, we could do what the flesh says to do. Well, I'm going to make a list, X, Y, and Z. I'm going to do those things. Um, Jesus actually said to Pilate in, in John 18, 36, my, this is not my kingdom. If this were my kingdom, I, I, my followers would fight. But this is not my kingdom. My kingdom is, is above. You see, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So we have to employ spiritual methods to achieve spiritual ends. We have to. And the good news is that our enemies, man, our enemies, they can imprison the body. They could take our freedoms. They, they could put us in jail. They could abuse us. They could torture us. They could even kill this body. But guess what they can't do? They can't stop us from praying. They can make it illegal. They can take it out of school. They can take it out of, of, of culture. But they cannot stop a believer from praying. So do the hard work of prayer despite opposition. And, there, and, and as we began this today, culture is more and more skeptical at least of prayer and at most opposing prayer as a platitude. The enemy, the spiritual enemies are certainly opposed to it. Our flesh thinks it's strange and odd. But it is the means by which we stand, which we commune with the God who makes us stand. So in prayer, be, um, let's see, doggedly devoted. Okay? And, and, and why? Why? Why do we need to be? Because it is strange. So here's the thing. Claim it. Embrace the strangeness of it. Celebrate when the world thinks you're a little odd because you do it. And it's hard because it's a discipline. It's got to be a daily thing, a daily part of life. And so to prevail, train yourself daily in it. Exercise it. Uh, you might say, get a prayer six-pack. Or guns, right? Get some prayer guns from, from the constant 
constant appeal to God in prayer. Um, you know, with exercise, you won't see any result. I mean, you're not gonna you're not gonna get a physique that you want if you're hit and miss, and if you don't work at it hard. Prayer, you know, God's gonna grow you to look more and more like Christ when you do the workout in prayer. And you spend time with God in prayer. And it's hard because it's opposed. It is absolutely opposed. And, and we need to keep this in mind. We, we go along the Christian walk and we, we forget the battle. We think, oh, everything's good today. Everything's easy out there. Life is good. I got the t-shirt. And the reality is, it is opposed so when choosing your battles each day, each day, I mean, you got to choose your battles every day, right? You got to pick which mountains you're going to die on. It's important to do. When you make that choice, make sure uh, you, you are listening to uh, the Spirit of God within you and not the old flesh. And choose prayer to be one of those battlefields that you are determined to fight for. All right, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that your word has such relevant application for us. If we are to be like Christ, if we are to point others to Christ, and if we're going to do that by growing to be like Christ so they can see Christ in us, Father, that is a spiritual endeavor and it requires spiritual means, spiritual methods, so, Father, if that requires that we be a little strange in the world's eyes, then may we be a little strange in the world's eyes as we commune with you. And, Father, if that means that, that we give up other battles so that we can fight and prevail in the area of prayer, to, be, to intercede for our brothers and sisters and families and ourselves, and our church, and our, our, our nation, then, then, Father, may we be okay conceding other earthly battles to, to prevail in this spiritual battle. Father, I pray that it would be a daily thing. Father, forgive us for being so lax, so casual about prayer that we'll, get a, we'll do it when we get around to it. Or we'll do it when we, when we see we desperately have a need. Father, we are so blind to how desperately needy we are. Because the tasks you've called us to as believers can only be done in your strength and power. Only in your strength and power. So, Father, help us be disciplined in prayer in the coming days. Father, that we might through that exercise, be shaped more like Christ so that the world will want Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.